Order, order. I call Nick Fletcher to move the motion. I beg to move that this House is considered a petition 600593 relating to the use of free running snares. Thank you, Chair, and it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship today and open this Westminster Hall debate. This petition received over 102,000 signatures. The petitioners who are here today ask that the government prohibit the sale and use and manufacture of free running snares by amending the Wildlife and Countryside Act of 1981 to put them in the same category as self-locking snares, which are already illegal. This follows on the heels of other events in Parliament in the previous year, such as the member for St Ives tabling a question to the Secretary of State for DEFRA about the use of snares, as well as an EDM from the 31st of January last year calling on the ban of the use of all snares. Before going into the general points, it should be noted that both Scotland and Wales have different rules to England when it comes to snares. Scotland takes a more rigorous approach in that the Wildlife and Natural Environment Scotland Act 2011 demands that snare users must achieve approved accreditation, receive a personal identification number from the police and attach an identification tag to every snare when set. It is also true that the Scottish Government's wildlife team are at present conducting a statutory review on whether snares should be banned altogether. Wales announced in 2021 that it intends to completely ban the use of snares and a bill is set to go through this year. It was laid before the Senate on the 26th of September last year. In England, the last review on the use of snares was almost 19 years ago when a review was carried out in October 2004. In the review, DEFRA asked for a working group to be set up to look at the use of snares. They found a series of uncomfortable truths occurred whenever such devices were used. They included the following. Stress and anxiety for the captive animal, fear of predation, friction of the snare as the animal tries to escape, dislocations and amputations, ischemic pain due to lack of blood circulation, compression injuries, thirst and hunger. There is more, the list does go on. The petitioners argue that all the above are inexcusable in the 21st century, but what is worse, these snares are often snaring the wrong animal. They often catch cats, dogs, badgers and deer, and when they do, it can often lead to a painful death. A post-mortem on a badger caught in a snare read as follows. He was in good body condition, but had been dead for at least 48 hours. X-rays show as an indentation around his neck, which corresponded to the visible bruises around his throat. This was consistent with the snare being placed around the throat. There were also recent, recent wounds to the pads on both his front feet. The vet said these injuries were consistent with him having scrabbled violently to try and get free prior to death. He also had bruised gums around his canine teeth, consistent with him having to try to bite a hard, thin object, such as a wire, before he died. His windpipe contained some stomach contents and also a bloody, frothy mucus. I've got to give way. I'm very concerned for Jimmy Gray, and that's a horrible set of words that he's just, um, he, he, he's just um, shared with us. But I think that's really the point, and I, I wonder if he would agree with me that what he has described as indiscriminate cruelty that obviously causes horrific suffering to animals. Um, and that is the reason that the petitioners are so concerned and that we should likewise be deeply concerned about this kind of behaviour. Thank the Honourable Member for contributing what we've just said. Yeah, no one can uh, say that that is um, the way that we want uh, any, animal, any animal to die. And the petitioners will, will no doubt agree. In the vet's opinion, this young male badger died as a result of asphyxiation caused by a ligature placed around his neck, probably a snare. As I've just said, this is not a pleasant read. I posted on social media that I was to lead this debate. It was widely shared and many, many people posted comments. It is fair to say that the vast majority, if not all the comments, were totally opposed to the continued use of snares. I will indeed. Bella? <clears throat> always be slightly cautious about the self-generation on social, on social media. It can be indicative. 
But even more relevant, surely, is the opinion polling that shows well over three quarters of the population believe snares should be banned. The opinion of this House over several years, even decades, has been very clear. Isn't it time for the government to bring legislation forward for this and indeed for other animal welfare issues? We don't seem to have a great deal of business holding us up at the moment. Maybe they should get on with it. Nick Fletcher. I thank the Honourable Member for his comments. But as we say, this is a debate, and I will come on further to that. The opinion poll, as you say, definitely lead towards the banning of this, but we need to debate this. That's why the idea of um, this petition has been brought to this House today. My starting point is the same as the commentators and petitioners. Nobody should want to see any animal harmed, never mind killed, unless there are very strong reasons to do so. Nevertheless, animals are killed and people support that. I give an example. Dangerous dogs that have harmed or even killed a child are put down. Our feelings make it difficult to move on to the other side of this debate, but we must do so. This is a debate. It is not a platform where only one view can be heard. There must be no cancellation here. We therefore need to ask why snares are being used in this day and age. And there are, good reason, are there good reasons for their continued use? In life, you learn that there is always two sides to a story. As an MP, that is especially the case. I have never found that everybody has agreed with me on everything that I have ever said. We all have different views, and I welcome that we live in a democracy, in a country where freedom of speech is so strong. Many countries are not so blessed. So I have made efforts to speak to those who support the continued use of snares. I wanted to know why they believe that snares are a good thing when we know what the DEFRA review found. One ga gamekeeper I have been in contact with told me that if snares are used in compliance with current legislation, they are a humane way of not only protecting the farming world's livelihood, but also actually to pr protecting the environment too. I am not convinced the aforementioned budget would agree with any of that. However, for the record, I have not had clarification that the above incident that I previously mentioned happened with an illegal snare or a legal snare. Which brings me on to the snare itself. We talk about snares. What is a legal snare? Not all snares are illegal. There are regulations in force on what is. Let me tell you what I have discovered. The snares, now called humane cable restraints, are engineered with five safety devices. Two swivels, an anchor swivel and a middle swivel. These reduce entanglement. Next is the running eye, which is free running. This is a legal requirement in the UK. This helps reduce strangulations. Previously, snares were ratcheted and strangulation often occurred not just to the intended creature, but also to non-target animals too. Ratcheted snares are now illegal. There is a fixed stop. This allows smaller animals to remove themselves. It thus reduces the chance of strangulation of the target animal also, which is apparently mainly foxes. The final component is a breakaway device. This is there so that if animals of a certain size pull hard enough against the snare, it will break and they will be set free. These devices were initially tested by 34 gamekeepers across the country and proved to be a much improved device on the previously used snares. That's the snare. Now let's discuss what the law says as to how they can be used. The law says the snares should be checked every 24 hours. The code of practice states preferably before 9am and each day and if a gamekeeper is able, inspect it again at the end of each day. If this procedure is rigorously followed, then this should minimise the number of captured animals that go through the pain the previously mentioned post-mortem report described. Is it rigorously followed? It is a fair question. The device should also be inspected daily for signs of rusting or fraying of the cord. They also need to check its working. In particular, the effectiveness of all the safety devices should be checked to see if they are working. This is an emotive subject, and I can understand the petitioner's point of view, and also understand that in an animal-loving country as ours, why many would want to stop this method of catching animals. It's natural to feel that way. I share those feelings too. The gamekeepers, however, do much to look after our countryside. 
They say they need snares to enable them to do their job. I have heard that they are stopping some birds from becoming extinct. Lapwing and curlews are two examples of the birds that are in danger of becoming extinct to the west of the UK. Foxes are to blame for much of their demise. However, for a relative townie like me to sit in an armchair and say this is wrong and even barbaric is relatively easy for me to do. But I am conscious that I have little understanding of the countryside and the steps necessary to protect it. Those who have spent their lives in the countryside say snares are necessary. We need to know who is right and who is wrong. We need evidence. I therefore am pleased the government consider it timely to open a call for evidence to make sure it has the very latest understanding on the issue. Both sides of this argument must be listened to. This is essential. Council culture is iniquitous and has no place in a functioning democracy. I believe I speak for many, if not all of us, when I say it is also essential that we reduce any inhumane treatment of our wildlife while still helping our gamekeepers protect our countryside. I believe there are many areas in life where there is a solution if legislators, animal rights groups, activists, concerned citizens and all those in the countryside sit down and talk things through. This surely must be one issue. With Wales and Scotland moving quickly towards a complete ban, I would suggest the time is of the essence for such talks and that maybe solutions such as humane snares, reflective dishes, <coughs> electric fences or even high sonic devices could be used. I am told that many in the countryside don't believe tighter legislation will work. Gamekeepers believe mandatory training will. That is also an issue that needs to be addressed. I am grateful to the petitioners for bringing this debate to Parliament. We need to establish the evidence and make any necessary adjustments to the existing legislation that are appropriate and proportionate. What they should be is not exactly known yet. However, this process must start and I look forward to its conclusions. I therefore hope this debate is the start of a sensible conversation where tempers are not frayed and a solution can be found. Thank you. I remind members, as they are doing, uh, to Bob if they wish to uh, speak. I intend calling the front bench speakers beginning at around about five past seven. So if members could limit themselves to seven or eight minutes, we'll be, uh, all, all will be guaranteed to, uh, to get in. Uh, I call... Uh, sorry, the question is that this House has considered e-petition 600593 relating to the use of snares. I call Jim Shannon... I think I called, um, so I, I maybe haven't just prepared me exactly. I'm just going to sit back down again, as I often do, jump up and sit down. Uh, can I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for calling me? Uh, I'm very pleased to speak in this debate. Um, I, I, uh, um, I've been a long-time sports enthusiast. Um, I, I love the countryside. I live in a farm. I, um, I'm a member of the Ulster Farmers Union. I'm a member of BASC. I'm a member of the Countryside Alliance. I'm a member of Country Sports Ireland. Um, I say those things because I want to put things in context. Uh, and I think it's important that I do so. I thank the Honourable Gentleman for setting the scene. Uh, and, and I understand that, that he is here to represent the petitioners. But I feel that I must, Mr Chairman, uh, um, represent the views of, of what I believe to be a balanced point of view uh, to ensure that, the, that the, the birds that the Honourable Gentleman referred to, and I will refer to them just shortly, uh, uh, the, the uh, lapwings, the, the curlew. Um, we used to have in our farm, Mr Chairman, have actually thousands, hundreds, not hundreds of thousands, hundreds and thousands uh, of, of lapwings in, along the edge of Strangford Lock where I live. Those numbers have decreased. Uh, why have they decreased? Uh, I, I would suggest that they've decreased because of the predation of, of, of a number of, of um, animals where the, 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 uh, the main restraints, I would refer to them as, that's where we've moved to. I think we've got to acknowledge that there's been a, 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 a very, very clear movement amongst the people. I'm, pr I'm proud to, uh, that the main thrust of country sports is conservation and preserving for future generations. And I certainly have passed all my love of country sports to my son, Jimmy, and to my granddaughter, Katie. Uh, they have learned firsthand that the first duty is to the land and sustaining the land and to the farmers that live around us as well. And I think it's really important. Uh, as a representative of a mixed urban and rural constituency, I have an acute 
uh, awareness of the needs of the farming community. And I'm often guided by the needs of the agri-industrial se sector in cooperation with advancing information and ways forward in our modern world. Now, I'm not against change, Mr Chairman, and uh, certainly not, but I am in, in, the, in the business of, of, of realism and, and, and what we're trying to achieve. So I'm proud of the way that farmers have taken on diversification and made changes which their grandfathers may never have understood, and yet at the same time, I have a real respect for the generational learning which can be understood and felt through a report on, page on, on a page alone. So I want to make a, give a quotation, a quotation if I can. I made contact with the country said Lance, who provided the following statement to be heard today in this debate. I'm going to quote it in its entirety, Mr. Chairman, because I think it's important that we do so. The, the, the clock hasn't come up in, in time, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> I just want to remind you so that I know exactly. Right, okay, right, that's great. Um, um, <laughs> snaring is one of a range of essential measures used to manage certain species. The, this is from Countryside Lands, the control of which underpins agriculture production, farm animal husbandry, the sustainable harvesting of game birds, and the protection of species of the highest conservation concern, including the curlew and the lapwing. Specifically, it is a legitimate and effective form of fox control, especially in habitats where other control techniques are either ineffective or impractical. So whenever we say do away with everything, we have to have the alternative. Uh, and, and that's what I want to perhaps maybe put forward. I think government has the alternative, and, and I think that's the position we're at. He, he goes on to say, in response to previous calls for the government to ban the production and use of snares, the Countryside Alliance and other countryside organisations work with DEFRA, to, our DEFRA here, the Minister's Department, uh, uh, to produce a code of best practice on the use of snares for fox control in England, which was published in 2016. That code, I believe, reflected the current state of knowledge following extensive research into the use of fox snares by, just, just, by different interest designs, groups design, uh, snare design, operating practices, selectivity, and the condition of captured animals. Very happy to give way. I'm very grateful to my honourable friend for giving way. And, um, he, he's making a, a point about DEFRA and their involvement in this area. I wonder if he would reflect um, for us his views on DEFRA's independent working group on snaring and the, the paper that they produced, which details the kind of suffering and injuries which animals which are snared might experience, the pain associated with dislocations, the fear, the stress, the anxiety, the injuries to muscles, the thirst, the hunger, the exposure, inflammatory pain, the malaise associated with infections. I could go on at significant length, and I wonder if that is a part of the report that he has reflected upon at all. Jim Shannon. I'm very happy to reflect the, um, the, the opinion of the Honourable Lady and, and others as well, because what I'm saying is that the, the, the snares of yesterday year are not acceptable, but the humane uh, restraints that the uh, government has reflected today are a way of moving forward. I think the Honourable Gentleman uh, when, he, when he introduced the, the, the petition debate and conversation and, uh, and, 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 and as we have before us, he referred to, to how the, the department has moved forward. Um, to, to have the snares of yesterday year, I, I, I say quite clearly, uh, would be totally wrong because there is little or no humane control of them. But what we have today in the humane restraints is a methodology, and that's what DEFRA have, and they have that in place. So when it comes to, to looking at the way forward, I think we do have a way. Hello, Fox. Um, um, cold compliance snares are restraining rather than killing device, and only these can be used in England. Hello, Fox trapping is not subject to the agreement of international humane trapping standards. Research has also indicated that the code of practice compliance snares operated according to best practice past the agreement's uh, requirements for humaneness. So, as a humane and effective means of fox control, snares are, and I refer to, to the humane restraints are an essential management tool that we cannot afford to lose. And I, and I, I make this statement very clear. Any changes to current legislation and regulations must be proportionate and justified. So I, I accept the honourable lady what you're saying, and I agree with her, but I think what government has in relation to the main restraints is the right way of doing that. The honourable gentleman also referred to, to gamekeepers. Um, I'm a shooting man, it's, it's no secret. Uh, I understand how, uh, that we have to control uh, the pest control uh, animals uh, and birds as well. I, I understand that I want to see more curly and, and lackwing numbers and the numbers that they once were. Uh, if you go look at the mirrors in, in Yorkshire, as an example, Mr. Chairman, um, they, they, I think somebody was just saying where there once was 20 or 30 curly and lapwings nesting, he now has one. And that's the interpretation. 
Uh, so those things have to be have to be addressed. BASC have also highlighted, and we must remember that the manufacturer sale and, and, and use of snares in the UK is already subject to legislation and various codes of practice, and that use of snares is a vitally important predator management tool that enables land managers to protect livestock, game birds, ground nesting birds from predation by foxes, where other methods of control are not viable. So we have to look at the, getting the balance in, in the countryside, uh, and, and I believe that the humane restraints are that balance, uh, and, and both the shooting organisations, Countryside Alliance, uh, the BASC, and, and the third organisation that I belong to, Country Sports Ireland, also believe that as well. A ban on all snares would remove the, la the latest, most modern fox snare designs, which should, should correctly be referred to as, and this is the solution, this is the right way forward, because that gives a balance to the countryside, ensures that, the, uh, that, that we, that, um, um, restraint can be given to, to the predation um, uh, foxes, and, and it's referred to as humane cable restraints. Humane cable restraints are used by conservationists and landowners to prevent foxes predating on ground, uh, uh, rare ground nesting birds such as la curlew, lapwing, and golden plover. Uh, I, I mentioned uh, uh, about my own area uh, where I live in the edge of Strangford Lock in Northern Ireland, where the, the, the numbers of lapwing and, and, <coughs> and curlew have reduced. Uh, to, to a, a great extent, even golden plover as well, I have to say. So, so it's about getting the balance. Um, uh, and, and control of foxes is critical so that, that some of our nesting waders don't become extinct. Otherwise, that would refer to that in his, in his contribution. Uh, and that's the danger if we don't have some sort of control. Humane cable restraints, the alternative, uh, are also used by wildlife biologists carrying out research with the foxes caught being re released unharmed, I quote, and a number being recaptured. Removing the lawful use of humane cable restraints to catch and hold foxes at times of the year and in locations where other methods simply do not work would have serious and unintended consequences for nature conservation. So as a conservationist, which I am, and I'm sure everyone else is here as well, uh, then we have to find a balance and a way of control. I've seen it firsthand, as uh, I suspect some here may have well, seen the, the, uh, the foxes... Uh, uh, own, um, uh, country, his own blood sports where he, he's, he's uh, uh, been in a, a hen house where he's killed. I've, I've witnessed it. I've, I've seen the, I've, I remember it very much, uh, must be 35, 40 years ago, but I remember it well. One of the, the two ladies, uh, two sisters, and that every one of their hens killed their, their, their prize hens. I've also witnessed the, uh, I've been aware of, um, uh, where someone's um, uh, uh, a flock of ducks uh, had been decimated also by by, by the predation of the fox. So when I come to, to finding a balance, for me, recognising the, 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 uh, that snares as they were of, of yesterday year are not acceptable, but I believe that the humane cable restraints are, because it's already been proven that they are. It's been proven by biologists, it's been proven by, by other um, uh, ones involved in, 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 in conservation, and I, I think it's important that we do that. I conclude with this, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Uh, the view of these two main bodies, that's the Countryside Alliance and, and, and the BSC, along with local farmers, because I, I live in a farm, um, I've made that declaration uh, early on, I, I know what the farmers uh, uh, have asked me to do, uh, and have made it clear to me that they must ensure a viable, humane and effective alternative is in place. And I'm not sure that we have that, although I remain open to have my mind cha changed on that. But I do believe a humane cable restraints are that alternative. The fact is that what the foxes do to livestock is not merely to decimate the flock. That's the sheep as well, by the way. Uh, and a farmer uh, had contacted me there where um, I, I, one dog, not, not a fox, a dog, had, had chased the, 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 uh, uh, the sheep around the field and, and some of the sheep had aborted. Um, <coughs> the fox will, will, will uh, take the lamb that's born whenever the, the mother and the ewe is vulnerable. The fact is that what the foxes do to livestock is not merely to decimate the flock, but to destroy livelihood. And this serious problem must have a serious solution. And I feel that the humane cable restraints are and must be accepted as such. I look forward to hearing what the minister will say in a response, because I always respect the minister. I know that, that, that the minister looks deeply into these subject matters and, and tries to come up with a, a, a methodology uh, that can, can do. The, the Honourable Gentleman, and I conclude with this comment, he referred to, to, to gamekeepers who, uh, the code of practice is clear. Uh, the gamekeepers should, should check their, 
their, their um, hum humane cable restraints twice a day. Uh, they, they agree to that. The County State Alliance agrees to that. The BASC agrees to that. County Sports Ireland agrees to that. So let's have something with balance uh, and let's have it not screwed away with a different interpretation. I recognise the snares of the past are wrong, but humane cable restraint is the right way forward. Thank you. Goodwill. Thank you very much indeed. Vickers. First of all, I think it's important to say that no civilised person will view the taking of any animal's life lightly or do anything other than limit or mitigate any suffering involved. Dare I say that they're not just chess pieces to be knocked off the board. Now, as a, as a farmer and a countryman myself, I understand the need to have humane tools for the control of predators, although we have no livestock on my farm at the moment, I'm, I'm not a game shooter, but I understand the importance of having a balance. We no longer have the predators, such as lynx and wolves, which will take out foxes. And we're talking in the main about foxes. Although my select committee is, is on starting a report on reintroduction of species, it may be we'll touch on those particular species. But it's important that we have effective predator control, not, not only for wildlife, but also uh, not only for agriculture, but also for, for wildlife. It, this isn't just about game shooting and the interests of gamekeepers. For example, as the Honourable Member for Strength has just pointed out, uh, sheep uh, farmers often have problems with foxes as, as lambs are born, while the ewes having a second lamb, a fox can come and take the first lamb before it's had a chance to get to his feet. And of course, we have more and more outdoor pigs, something we should be encouraging as a more environmentally and humane method of rearing pigs. And of course, those piglets themselves are subject, uh, sadly, uh, to predation. Poultry as well, as we've heard, although most farmers do manage to shut their hens up at night when the foxes generally operate, but we have seen the situation where urban foxes, which have been trapped in urban areas, are released into the countryside. And sadly, those foxes don't understand that they're nocturnal. They have no fear of humans. And often, we've had problems in rural areas where urban foxes have been actually hunting in the daylight, uh, which has been an additional problem for poultry keepers. It is important that we, that we can protect game. The game industry is a very important industry. It's very important for rural communities. It's very important for the rural economy. And indeed, in a way, we're in a win-win situation that the measures, particularly on the moorland in my constituents where grouse shooting is very prevalent, the management practices in terms of heather management and predator control not only benefit the grouse, which can't be bred artificially, but also benefit ground nesting birds such as curlew, golden plover and lapwing. Indeed, we have a very interesting situation developing in my constituency where one of the estates uh, are seeking to plant quite large areas of woodland. Uh, and these plans are actually being opposed uh, or certainly not smiled upon by Natural England who are worried that these woodland areas will become a harbour for predators which will then go on to the neighbouring uh, moorland where there isn't a, a grouse shoot, so no gamekeepers are operational there, and actually wipe out large numbers of these ground nesting birds which they seek to actually protect. In fact, very important ground nesting birds, particularly the curlew. And, of course, it's important for scientific research that there is a humane method of capturing some of these foxes and, for example, uh, tagging them with, uh, with, with uh, uh, tags which will allow them to be tracked. Uh, and, indeed, I've seen videos of uh, a fox caught in one of the new type of cable restraint which has then been released unharmed. In fact, sometimes these foxes are caught on a number of occasions. We've heard from our honourable friend for Don Valley how the new type of, 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 of uh, humane cable restraints are very different from the old self-locking snares that were made illegal uh, since 1981, and quite rightly too. They have a number of features, as we've heard. Uh, they have a, a stop, which means that they will not strangle a fox. In fact, smaller species that go into a snare will escape unharmed. They have a breakaway, which means that if a large animal such as a deer gets into a snare, they will be able to escape uh, by breaking that breakaway. But of course, if the gamekeeper knows his job, he will not put a snare in a place where these species could be there. And of course, finally, uh, there is a swivel, which means that if the, if the animal uh, twists and turns a little at the start when it's first caught, it will not strangle itself by that process. And indeed, it's important as well that these uh, uh, cable restraints are not set, for example, near, near, near fences, and they're well anchored so that if the animal is restrained, it can actually remain there. When the gamekeeper visits the snare, he can then 
humanely dispatch that fox. I mean, we, we can have a debate about whether foxes should be a protected species, but if we do need to control foxes, we need to do it in the most humane way. So what are the alternatives? I suppose shooting is the most obvious one, but of course shooting can be very difficult near settlements. Uh, shooting is difficult in, in, in dense vegetation, but I think the most important argument against shooting is that if a fox is wounded, and often these shots are taken from quite a distance, given the cautious nature of foxes, that wounded fox can then go off and die uh, in agony uh, of gangrene or, or its wounds. So, you know, at least uh, we don't have the situation where an animal is wounded and, and goes off to die. Uh, there are other alternatives, such as gassing and poisoning, but again, these could mean that non-target species uh, are affected and cannot be released uh, unharmed. So I believe that the continued professional use by trained personnel of these cable restraints is important to our management of the countryside, it's important to the management of our wildlife, and I believe the alternatives uh, certainly don't bear too much scrutiny in terms of the relative uh, hum uh, humaneness of those. Uh, set correctly, uh, as, as, as I've already said, uh, and, and, and checked every 24 hours, indeed checked before 9 o'clock in the morning because most foxes are, are nocturnal, I believe this is an important tool in our wildlife management. And the alternatives do not bear the sort of scrutiny that maybe this type of control would have. So I hope we will continue to use, responsibly use these cable restraints as a way of managing our countryside and ensuring that our wildlife and our economic interests in terms of game and agriculture are protected. Thank you. to serve with you in the chair and I'm grateful to be able to speak in today's debate not least because we've had 102,616 petitioners 216 of which are from my constituency 418 from York I have to say sitting here it is completely indefensible some of the arguments which have been put forward and I hope to deconstruct them in the time that I have as well snares are cruel no ifs no buts they cause suffering and must be banned. In fact, in, in July 2016, I announced that Labour would bring forward a ban. And here we are, eight years later, nine years later now, and we are no further forward. We've been promised a consultation by government 2021. We're now entering 2023. These delays are just not acceptable. Wales are getting on with the job and legislating, and of course, Scotland consulting and just before Christmas announced that they'll be proceeding with the ban as well and that is the direction that we must in fact across the EU there's only four countries left which don't have a ban on snares and that's why we mustn't be left behind left in an archaic age where man thinks they've got a right to go and hunt and enjoy game and sport these animals should never be our sport they're precious parts of our creation which we must nurture and care for. And therefore, I want to deconstruct some of the arguments that have been made this afternoon. We have 188,000 snares in operation at any one time. 1.7 million animals killed. And out of those, when the Honourable Gentleman for Strangford was talking about foxes, we must remember 75% of those animals snared are not foxes. And I'll come on to foxes in a moment. But um, it just goes to show that um, those arguments do not hold up. We know that 33% of them are hares, not predatory animals. 26% of them badgers. 14% of them from other species as well. There's otters, there's deers, even horses get caught um, in these snares. And whilst they do have breaks in them, not every animal does break free. And as a result of that, that will cause so much suffering. And of course, we've heard about that suffering, asphyxiation, laceration, dislocation, amputation, starvation, dehydration, and predation. And of course, much in the debates in, in this house uh, over the last... Uh, five or six years has been about looking at uh, animals as being sentient beings. They know what's happening to them, their mental distress impacting on them. And as a result of that, we absolutely must move forward with legislation now to, uh, to catch up with what's happening and Labour are doing in Wales and, of course, what we're seeing in Scotland as well. And, of course, when we look at nature itself... Um, there is a balance in nature, and that balance does not give us the right to protect wildlife for our own personal game. And that's what's happening. And, and it's, whilst the, the shooting lobby may well be having its 
um, say today in this debate. What I would say is that um, we can't continue with this right um, that we think we have and power over nature. Nature will find its balance, and it's important that we nurture that balance and enable it to, to land. And, of course, when we look back, things have been worse, I agree, with the, the self-locking snares. But that was um, abolished back in 1981. And, therefore, four decades later, we've got a responsibility to look at the scene again today. I'm happy to give way. Different uh, point of view. Uh, but they agree on the fact that the old snares are not acceptable, but the humane restraints are, are the alternative for the balance and the way forward. Uh, the Honourable Lady refers to about getting balance. Um, if we continue to ignore the predation of foxes and, and other mammals who uh, predate upon lapwings and plover mm -hmm. and curlew, we won't have any of them. How would the Honourable Lady? set about ensuring that curlew, lapwing and plover can still be here for my children and my grandchildren? So well, I'm grateful to the Honourable Member's question. I think the uh, Honourable Member, um, who is a, a friend from North Yorkshire, really made the case where he was talking about Natural England's um, determination that by building a woodland, then you would encourage predatory animals to an area where these animals already breed and have their freedom. So I think it just goes to show there are other measures that can be taken. And that's where I really want to land today's speech, because I do believe there are other measures that can be taken to ensure that we do have strong biodiversity across our country to ensure that we move forward from where we are. And of course, we've heard already about the, the opportunity um, for a consultation that's absolutely necessary. But within that, how is technology being deployed? We're seeing technology being deployed in all other areas of life, but where we can actually track where these animals are, where, where the, the risks are, where the opportunities are for bringing in those controls as opposed to this random process where 75% of animals captured are not of the, the species which uh, the Honourable Gentleman refers to. But also, are there other things that can be done with regards to farming techniques that can take forward the technology? And again, that is very little discussed because of this whole dependency on snares, and that's why we must move forward in that area to ensure that um, lambs are protected in the, in the lambing season, you know, and further measures taken there. We know um, certainly um, in other countries the intensity of shepherds around their, their newborn lambs is a way of protecting um, that population. We also um, should be looking at the opportunities that um, we can move forward with um, further biosecurity measures which could be taken as well. So these areas need further exploration in order to move forward. But I, I just want to close on the issue of the fox because the poor fox is so vilified and yet it is such the most magnificent of creatures. And um, every time I see a fox, <laughs> I just stop and just see how magnificent it is, how intelligent it is and how beautiful a fox is. And it is all part of our biodiversity, which we have been so blessed to um, be amongst. And I think we should end the vilification of foxes. And certainly we know that it's a difficult period for foxes with the hunting that still continues. We think about the trail hunts, which government really, really must get on top of and ban, and to ensure that we ensure that all of our biodiversity and our nature is maintained and restored. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to serve under your chairmanship and given my long-standing interest in improving animal welfare standards in this country, it will be no surprise to honourable colleagues that I stand today in support of the petition. I implore the government to follow most European countries who have banned snares altogether and to work with the devolved administrations in Wales, which is banning the use of snares, and Scotland, um, who conducted a statutory review into the practice and in December its Animal Welfare Commission recommended a ban which our Scottish colleagues will be closer to the process but I hope that the Scottish Government will agree with the recommendation but by doing so England will be left behind. Now 
My Honourable colleague, when he uh, uh, proposed the petition, spoke of the cruel nature of snares and how they are indiscriminate in catching and harming wildlife, whether that be foxes, badgers, hedgehogs, or in some cases domestic pets. And the Honourable Lady for York Central spoke brilliantly, uh, in my view, highlighted the statistics, so I won't repeat them. But it is my very strong view that there is no need for snares at all. There is no justification for them. They are old school methods of pest control that has no place in a modern society, especially if it is to be one that respects its natural environment and those who live in it. Mr Vickers, I'd like to focus my preliminary comments on the response so far from the government on both the issue of snares and the other progressive animal welfare improvements that have been promised since the 2019 election. In responding to the petition exactly a year ago, the department stated the government recognises that some people consider snares to be an inhumane and unnecessary means of trapping wild animals and will launch a call for evidence on the use of snares. Now, I take issue with the use of the word some by the department in its response, and I hope that in her response the minister will provide reassurance that they do actually understand the sense of public opinion on this issue. Research by Salvation, commissioned by the League Against Cruel Sports, found that almost three in four members of the public support a ban on snares. Meanwhile, a 2021 YouGov poll found that 69% of people support a ban on the use of snares, while only 14% oppose such a ban. Therefore, I would argue that it would be correct to say that some people are in support of the use of snares, while most of the British public wish to see their use come to an end. Secondly, in its January 20. 22 response to the petition, the government further committed to assessing the improper use of snares and whether further legislation is needed to protect non-target wildlife. Yet a year has passed and we are no closer to seeing this call for ev evidence. This consultation was first promised in the Action Plan for Animal Welfare in 2021 and I and many other colleagues spoke in more detail about the Action Plan before Christmas in a debate in this chamber. I and the countless animal welfare organisations that have long championed issues such as ending the use of snares welcome the action plan as a statement of intent from the government and that which recognised that it was serious about its pledges to maintain the highest animal welfare standards in the world. Therefore, the lack of action, with a few exceptions, has been incredibly disappointing. Proponents of snares point to the Voluntary Code of Best Practice, which provides for principles for their legal and humane use. Yet the ambiguity of the law is evident, even within the text of the code, which is endorsed by the major hunting organisations. The code states that if you follow the advice, you should be operating within the law regarding animal welfare and avoiding non-target species. I'm concerned that the code of practice endorsed by the sector masks the failings to the government and relevant agencies to enable it to properly scrutinise those that administer snares to ensure that they adhere to the rules set out in the provisions of the Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981. In fact, research carried out by DEFRA between 2008 and 2010 on the humaneness of snares in England and Wales found low levels of awareness and compliance, especially among farmers regarding the code of best practice for snares. I'd therefore be very interested if the department plans to revisit such a study and how it measures the legality of stairs in England. The code is, as far as I can tell, not a statutory code. So given the law says that snares should be checked once a day while the code says twice a day, it is highly likely that the least time-consuming requirement is going to be the one that is followed, if it is followed at all, as enforcement is highly unlikely. Free-running snares have been championed in agriculture and game-shooting circles as humane way of catching foxes and other target animals. The more modern device is meant to tighten around an animal and hold it quietly until a gamekeeper from the shoot comes to kill it. Unfortunately, this is all too often not the case. The suggestion that a wild animal will calmly wait while it is trapped by its neck is clearly absurd. It is not surprising that in their desperate struggle to escape, animals can strangle themselves or suffer excruciating injuries while waiting hours or suddenly even longer before they are shot. Government claims to, sorry, for a government that claims to hold the highest standards of animal welfare in the world, they would not allow for wild animals, many of which are indigenous to this country, to d die slowly and extremely painful deaths at the use of man-made 
metal loops. Contrary to the view of some colleagues, there is, as far as I'm concerned, no humane way to snare a wild animal. If we are serious in our ambition to have the highest standards, then the first step should be deliver on the Action Plan for Animal Welfare and in turn the promised government bills. This should also include the promised consultation on the use of snares. I hope that today's de debate and the pressure both from within this House and outside of it shows that there is a real appetite to deliver on the promises made to the Br British people to strengthen our animal welfare standards outside the constraints of the EU. So, Minister, please, can we just get on with it? Maureen Ferrier. Margaret Ferrier, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Vickers. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. And I'd like to start with thanking my honourable friend, the member for Don Valley, for opening today's debate and the more than 102,000 members of the public that signed the e-petition, including constituents of Rutherglen and Hamilton West. I should also thank Animal Aid and the League Against Cruel Sports for their excellent briefings ahead of today's debate. The United Kingdom is blessed with beautiful countryside, greenery and, of course, wildlife. The public feel very strongly about protecting that wildlife. We see it through the sheer number of signatures added to this petition and others, but also through opinion polls. According to One Kind, 76% of the Scottish public support a ban on the use of snares. We have some good animal welfare legislation and the government's action plan for animal welfare sets out a positive agenda. I do recognise it's a policy area that is in large part devolved and I will be touching on the position in Scotland slightly later. To state the obvious, I agree with the many voices calling for a ban on snares on the basis that they are cruel and indiscriminate, often capturing non-target species. And that reg registration or regulation models are ineffective in tackling the issues presented by their use. Self-locking snares are rightly illegal, so it's free-running snares we're here to discuss today. In England, their design and use are guided by a voluntary code of practice, which DEFRA research found to have low levels of compliance or even awareness of. It's also really important to recognise that free-running snares, when not properly maintained, begin to degrade and can act very similarly to illegal self-locking snares, which continue to tighten. A huge number of snares are set every year, running into the hundreds of thousands, so while there is a responsibility on owners to check them every 24 hours and ensure their upkeep, this isn't realistically achievable. As I mentioned, because the Code of Practice is industry-owned and non-statutory in England and they are predominantly used in private land, it is nearly impossible to monitor compliance. In Scotland, the use of free-running snares is more regulated with training, registration and record keeping mandatory in law, along with five yearly reviews of the effectiveness of the legislation. The latest review published in February last year included an acknowledgement that a further and wider review of snare use would be necessary, given the continuing concerns regarding the welfare of animals caught in snares. And I hope that in her speech, the Minister can provide some detail on what what work she and her colleagues are undertaking to engage with the devolved administrations on a ban to ensure that animals are protected fully and equally across the four nations. Even when used in compliance with the guidance or registered, the risk these snares pose to animals is unacceptable. I mentioned that snares are often not checked every 24 hours as the code sets out, and there are many reasons for that. But think about what that means for an animal trapped within one for hours, days, weeks on end. In a panic, they may aggressively struggle and die of it asphyxiation. They may, quite like a human, might literally freeze in fear, also known as tonic immobility. If snared by non-intended parts of the body, such as the leg, shoulder or abdomen, animals can suffer horrific injuries, left, left suffering needlessly until someone comes to release them. Some gnaw at the wire, biting at their own flesh to try and get out. They may be preyed on by another animal, or they die of hypothermia, dehydration or starvation. It is horrific and cruel. 
DEFRA research also found that up to 68% of animals caught in snares were non-target animals. This presents a whole raft of other problems. For example, the stop on a snare set for a fox will already be much too tight for animals like badgers, which are, by the way, legally protected. Here I want to illustrate why the Scottish Government are conducting a wider review and why the Scottish Animal Welfare Commission recommended a complete ban on snare use in December last year. Last week, a news article highlighted a horrible instance of a young badger cub caught in a snare in, in Skyburn last month, leaving it hanging from a gate while it struggled. A passerby spotted the cub in distress, and when animal welfare charity worker Alexis Fleming arrived on scene, she found that over 20 strands of wire had wrapped around its neck and body as it had frantically tried to free itself. The cub was taken to the charity's premises where they were able to remove the wire and treat the wounds caused. It was thought he had been there trapped for at least a few days. He was trapped by an, Ill uh, by an illegal snare and would have been asphyxiated if not for some stones under the gate he could use to support himself. Bits of sharp metal in the wire, described as similar to barbed wire, were caught in the cub's neck, leaving him suffering tissue damage and necrosis. So when we say that snares are indiscriminate, this is what we mean. And it's not just non-target wild animals. Pets have been caught in them too, like cats or dogs. It's quite normal for pet cats to roam about unattended. They're free spirits before returning home. Imagine if your cat didn't come home one day, perhaps because they're so independent, you don't worry about it immediately. Maybe you don't worry about it for a few days all the while he's caught in a snare, in pain, scared. I mentioned that snares are often used in private land and estates, and that's mostly to prevent animals preying on birds bred for shooting estates. That's a whole other issue in itself. Their use should not be seen as necessary, though they absolutely are not. Organisations with huge amounts of land to maintain, like the Woodland Trust, the Wildlife Trust, the RSPB, don't use them. In its response to this petition and as part of the Animal Welfare Action Plan, the government committed to publishing a call for evidence on the issue. That hasn't yet come to fruition. Many animal welfare organisations have been vocal about their opposition to snare use, including the British Veterinary Association, who stated in May, we are calling for the UK government to introduce an outright ban on the use and sale of snares to both the general public and trained operators. They are ready for that call for evidence when it is finally published. It is concerning, though, that it hasn't been already and how long it may take from publication to see any changes. I hope the Minister will be able to shed some light on this and provide some much-needed reassurance that this is a matter that the government recognises needing swift intervention. In 2023, Mr Vickers, there is really no excuse to allow animals to continue to suffer such awful injury and death. Uh, a pleasure to serve under your chairship today, and I'd like to thank the member for Don Valley for opening the debate um, in a measured way. Um, 267 constituents signed the petition um, showing the huge love of nature and um, animals in, in my constituency. Um, snares are indiscriminate, yet universally cruel. What is clear is that the non-statutory code simply is not enough to protect animals from painful injuries and suffering and death, uh, including protected animals, as we've heard, from badgers um, and even cats and dogs. DEFRA's own research shows that 68% of animals caught are not the intended target species. Under the code, snares should be checked twice, um, but as we know, the law is only every 24 hours. This is meaning that the condition of those snares, I think, would be difficult to understand given the volume that, um, of um, snares that are being set each year, which is at 1.7 million snares every single year. Um, there are, we've heard from other members about the huge number of um, impacts that snares can have on the well-being of animals um, and the lasting impacts that they can have from capture, capture myopathy and tonic immobility, thirst, um, starvation, dehydration, and, and many, many more. Um, and we know that snare users 
have admitted that non-target species uh, have have occurred in their own snares with the DEFRA research in 2008 to 2010 showing that fox snares for example 60 percent of people using snares admitted that they had captured non-target species in them landowners that do not use snares um, are not wanting to go back to their use and there are many many landowners of many thousands of hectares up and down the country uh, hundreds of thousands of hectares up and down the country who, who no longer use snares and will not use snares because they view them as incredibly cruel um, and we know that cats and dogs organizations are unified in their um, uh, in their uh, opposition to the use of snares because within three years 97 cats and 31 dogs were caught in snares now I'm a dog owner I've got a dog necklace on today and um, I would be horrified if out in the countryside my dog uh, was unfortunate enough to step on a snare and to be injured um, and I don't think anyone should have to go through that. Um, breakaway snares, we've heard in the debate, have um, been seen as kind of an answer to the situation. But however, 69% of badgers in, don't escape from these snares. So they're not a solution. They're not even 50% good at what they're saying they're good at. And the National Anti-Snaring um, Campaign actually commissioned TTI to do testing on these two snares. Um, and a force of over 70 kilos grams of weight would be needed on an, a space of two millimeter wide of the snare in order to cause a break. Now that is a huge amount of force that is needed to be um, exerted on a snare. And if you have ever seen an animal in a bad situation, you will know that they are not directionally pulling. They are um, in a very, very dynamic force and struggling and, and, and not going to be able to get out of these snares, which is why 69% of badgers were unable to escape from these snares. Um, we've also heard a lot about the different um, impacts of predators, but you know we have a 64% decline in rabbits, a 44% decline in foxes. Decline in nature species is incredibly complicated. You cannot just say this is down to predators. We've seen paper after paper, looking at habitat, habitat loss, agricultural practices, the impact of those on uh, insects and, and things that other bird species might eat, um, the lack and change of sowing of different crops and the impact on, on nesting uh, spaces within that. Um, and the impact of all of those different elements cannot, be, cannot just be laid at the feet of foxes or rabbits. It's, it, this is absolutely a falsehood and it's a false flag that predation, yes, is an issue, but there are absolutely alternatives to snaring to help protect species from predation, whether that is trap and release, electric fencing, wire netting, motion sprinklers, ultrasonic devices, and the use of radios and reflective, um, reflective surfaces. There are many, many different ways of putting pre um, predators off and making sure that we have a good habitation and landscape available to lapwings and curlews is the most important thing in their protection. Goodwill. Wait, does she genuinely think that those deterrence methods would be suitable and work on the vast thousands of acres on the North Yorkshire moors where uh, lapwings and, and, and curlews uh, need to be protected? Well, I think we, we know the nesting areas of certain birds and they, we already put signs up, don't we, to say keep your dogs on a lead or do not go in this area. And I think that actually, yes, where there, there has been a not, no longer use of snares on many, many hundreds of thousands of hectares, or these other, um, other uh, uh, you know, uses of different, different technologies have been used well, and, and we're not seeing any of those organisations who've moved away from snares saying, actually, it hasn't worked, we want to go back to using snares, because these alternatives have proved effective. So I just think that that needs to be on the record in this debate, that it is just a false flag saying that predation is the problem here. Loss of habitat and the uh, impact that we've had on our environment cannot be undersold in this, as I've said. And I just think that we need to ban snares because they are cruel, they are indiscriminate, as I've said, and there is nothing um, about them that we couldn't think outside the box around an alternative for. I think we've all got the ingenuity that the cruelty doesn't have to be the first and only option in the way that we manage our landscape and the way that we protect our, um, our species that are special to us. Person uh, Patricia Gibson. 
Chair, and I'm very pleased to be able to participate in this e-petition debate requesting that the UK Government prohibits the sale, use and manufacture of free and running snares under the Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981, putting them in the same category as self-locking snares, which are already illegal. And I wish to thank the Honourable Member for John Valley for his excellent opening speech introducing this debate on behalf of the Petitions Committee. And, Mr Chair, I would also like to applaud the work of the League Against Cruel Sports, Animal Aid and Cats Protection for all the work they do in promoting the welfare of animals and providing such excellent briefings for this debate as did the House of Commons Library. Of course, the matters raised, as we've heard, are devolved to the Scottish Parliament, but I understand the concerns and the depth of feeling in this matter. And just like in the previous debate on, on, on cats, um, we know that animal welfare is an issue very, very close to the heart of all our constituents across the UK. So again, it's no surprising that a petition such as this attracted over 102,000 signatures. Snares are used to catch foxes or rabbits, but of course, as we've heard, snares cannot distinguish between different species of animals, so the consequence of their use is indiscriminate. For example, the Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs has reported that almost 30% of rabbit snare operators have caught a cat causing horrible injuries, with cats often dying long and painful deaths if they are not rescued or not able to escape. We've heard today, Mr Chair, much about so-called humane snares. But we also know that so-called humane snares, snares still cause terrible problems for animals that are trapped with entanglement, injury and suffering. They make frantic attempts to escape, which of course is the natural reaction of any living creature when it feels itself trapped. Of course it's going to make frantic attempts to escape and it suffers real mental and behavioural stress because the creature itself that is trapped fears predation due to its restraint and it fears capture. And it's, it, it ends up with painful injuries inflicted by the snare and suffers thirst, hunger, exposure and even infections arising from injuries caused by this so-called humane snare. So I don't think many of us will put much weight on that. It is the case that in rural settings, of course, that sadly sometimes it is considered necessary to enable land managers to control certain species to protect livestock, crops and wild birds. However, it's also true that the lawful use of traps can sometimes result in unintended harm to wildlife and there are undoubtedly occasions when traps are not deployed or used in the way which complies with current regulations. And this was made clear in the Independent Grouse Moor Management Group commissioned by the Scottish Government and was published towards the end of 2019. Following the Snare Watch annual report in 2021, the Scottish Government commissioned an additional review which will look beyond the terms of the Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981 to consider a potential ban on snaring. Under consideration will be land management aspects of this matter as well as animal welfare because both things have to be considered as was outlined by the Honourable Member for Don Valley. And that's a position which many people have been calling for for some time. But in the meantime, Scotland does have the most robust laws on snaring in the UK, including requirements for registration and training. But there is no denying that creatures continue to suffer terrible and unnecessary, unnecessarily suffering, despite any well-intentioned well measures to mitigate this cruel and barbaric practice. The Scottish Animal Welfare Commission concluded that, as well as recommending a ban on the sale and use of glue traps, any traps that do not instantly kill or render a creature irreversibly unconscious are likely to inflict unnecessary suffering to a creature. So the use of snares must give cause for significant concerns for animal welfare. And that's why the Scottish Government is reviewing snare laws and because the inflicting of unnecessary suffering on any creature is simply unacceptable. And I believe it is possible to ban snaring 
whilst at the same time working constructively with land managers, which is what we all want to see. Ronald Munro, Professor of Forensic Veterinary Pathology, testified to the Scottish Parliament that, and I quote, snares are primitive, indiscriminate traps <coughs> that are recognised as causing widespread suffering to a range of animals. Being caught in a snare is extremely distressing for any creature and vigorous attempts to escape are natural. That shouldn't surprise anybody. He went on to detail the horrific injuries a snare can cause, which I won't detail because it is truly harrowing, but suffice to say his conclusion was that these unfortunate animals suffer immensely. And we heard further examples of that from the Honourable Member from Don Valley who opened this debate. We cannot allow this to continue. It is my hope that both the Scottish and the UK government will reflect on and consider the evidence and testimony. I have every faith in the Scottish Government's robust and compassionate approach to animal welfare to date, and I am sure it will ban these appalling snares once and for all. Um, meantime, it has imposed more regulation around their use and operation, but nothing can truly mitigate the suffering and cruelty caused. We need to move away from the use of snares completely, as Ireland and many of our European neighbours have already done. Where there is a need to control foxes and rabbits, etc., there are alternative, more humane ways to do so. We've heard about some of these today. Electric fencing, wire netting fences, motion sprinklers, ultrasonic devices, tree guards and the use of radios or reflective discs. Now, a whole range of genuinely humane alternatives are available, which is why so many countries have already banned snares completely. Should we not be looking at and learning from them? And I heard the Honourable Gentleman talking about how you deal with vast areas. For example, I think he mentioned the Yorkshire Moors. And my answer to that, and I don't pretend to have an answer to that particular problem, but my answer to that is that we must learn from our European partners who will, be, who will have grappled with the same kinds of issues. And there is much to learn and there are alternatives to be had. We cannot continue on the there is no alternative route when so much suffering is taking place. Because that really is what makes the barbaric use of snares all the more horrific. The fact that we have already at our disposal, if we choose to use them, so many alternatives available. If so many other countries are able to use more humane, effective alternatives, why would we not consider using these in the UK? So I hope and believe the Scottish Government will move to a position of banning smears, snares, and I know that the Welsh Government intends to do so. And in that spirit, I urge the UK government to do the same for England as well. It makes eminent sense for policy on this to be coordinated across the UK so that all creatures in the UK, wherever they happen to be, have the same protection from this cruel and, importantly, unnecessary practice. Thank you, Mr Vickers, and it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship this, this evening. Um, and on this first day of term, I extend good wishes to all colleagues gathered here today for the new year. And I do hope one and all, um, particularly the staff of this house and those in the offices of parliamentarians, enjoyed a happy and enjoyable Christmas with their family and friends and a very happy Hanukkah to our Jewish friends and colleagues too. I'd also like to pay tribute to the member for Don Valley for introducing this debate in such a measured way. It was very helpful to have the balances that he gave. But Mr Vickers, we are gathered here once again to discuss animal welfare, and I thank the more than 102,000 people who signed the petition in constituencies across our country. I note that every single one of the top 10 constituencies for signatories is represented by a Tory MP, including some ministers. And I hope this will gently guide the minister to provide real answers today. And if we can't get them here, I would be very happy for her to, have, uh, to write to me on, on responses. It was only a few weeks ago that we were here in this place discussing animal welfare and the kept animals bill, or rather the need for the ministers to bring it back to the house. Indeed, for any of those who waited and watched out for the environment bill all those months ago may remember me renaming it the missing in action bill. But I think we can now uh, describe the kept animals bill as the missing in action bill mark two. And I say that more in sorrow than anything because these benches, this side, believe in honoring our animal welfare promises and we will always push for the strongest possible animal welfare policies. That's why this debate on snares is so important. 
Colleagues across the House and in all parties will know that the United Kingdom is one of a small handful of countries in our part of the world that does not prohibit the use of snares in our green open spaces and on our farms. And we have all seen, I'm sure many members here have seen, the horrific film footage of, for example, badgers becoming entrapped. And that's not to mention the frequent reports already mentioned of domestic pets being caught in, injured by, or sometimes killed by snares. And whilst we have left the European Union, it is clear this government needs to wake up and join most countries in Europe in banning the use of snares. Mr Vickers, I make no apologies for my constant references to Wales and the important work being done by the Welsh Labour Government. As the Member of Parliament for Newport West, I can testify to their commitment and hard work. And that's why I welcome that the Welsh Government, in its programme for Government to the Senate after last year's election, committed to banning the use of snares in Wales. And of course, whilst Cardiff Bay is in the process of delivering here in Westminster, it's a very different picture. His Majesty's Government has made clear that it has no current plans to ban snares in England. And obviously, I would happily take an intervention from the Minister if that's not the case. I'm more than happy to do that. But is that, why is that important? You will know that there are, we will all know, there are numerous animal welfare issues with free-running snares. And thanks to the animal aid briefing sent through ahead of this debate, I want to remind colleagues of the impact of these snares. And many colleagues have already made these impacts far more eloquently than I can. But we know the old-fashioned snares may become frayed and rusty, leading to them behaving more like self-locking snares. Animals may not stop pulling when caught in their state of panic and can die of asphyxiation. Animals can be snared by other parts of their bodies, including abdomen, leg and shoulder, causing horrific injuries and a slow death. Non-target animals, such as legally protected badgers, as well as cats and dogs, as we've heard, may be caught in snares. In the case of badgers and some dogs, the stop, which has been mentioned, may have been set for foxes, and that's set far too tight for an already panicking animal. Similarly, if the animal is caught by an area that is bigger than the neck, the stop is ineffective, and the snare can and does cut into the animal, causing injury, pain, distress, and even death. Lactating animals may be trapped by a snare, leaving offspring to die of starvation. And snared animals may be attacked while still alive, but trapped by other animals um, and killed then. Additionally, animals might die of hypothermia, dehydration or starvation, as we've already heard. The impact of snares is clear, and that list is just a touch of the examples we could point to. The current legislation provides insufficient, well, insufficient protection for threatened species and the welfare of trapped animals. The Tory ministers appear to, in DEFRA appear to believe that oh, the onus is on trap operators to work within the law to avoid harming protected species or causing unnecessary suffering. But we know this is not working, so we need the government to step up and take firm action now. And at present, we have already heard, the Scottish government is consulting on potential measures to address snare use, with the ban expected to be one of the, among one of the options it considers. And I would urge ministers in Holyrood to be bold and ambitious and to give their colleagues in Cardiff a call if necessary. We on this side of the House believe that the UK government should follow the example of the Welsh Labour government in bringing forward legislation to ban the use of snares. They will have our support if they do so. And if they won't, they should get out of the way and we will add it to our to-do list when Labour forms the next government. Mm -hmm. Mr Vickers, our support for action on snares isn't new. We moved new clause 16 to the kept animals bill before ministers were forced to carry it over and then leave it on the shelf. And when my friend and colleague, the, the member for Sheffield Hallam, made clear that we want to see change, we want to see action, then that was some, some time ago now. And even before then, the honourable member for York Central in 2016 uh, committed Labour would ban snares. Back in May 2021, the Department published its action for animal welfare in which it pledged to launch a call for evidence on snaring. The then Minister for Nature Recovery and the Domestic Environment acknowledged that, and I quote, snares can cause immense suffering to both target and non-target animals, including pet cats and dogs. The then Minister was indeed correct, but as ever, and as the former Prime Minister, the member for Maidenhead would say, nothing has changed. A ban on snares has strong backing from the public and the NGOs alike. And I pay tribute to all the animal welfare charities and organisations working to deliver the change we all, certainly on this side, want to see. I think of HSI, of Animal Aid and the RSPCA, to name just a few. 
And it's important to note that a ban on snails was included in the sector's 2021 Act Now for Animals Green Paper, signed by more than 50 animal welfare charities. And a reminder that some polling conducted by Servation in 2020 showed that 73% of UK adults support a ban. So I'd like to thank all the stakeholders, campaigners and organisations who work day in and day out to fight for the welfare of our natural wildlife, our animals, our pets and this country to show real and meaningful leadership. We get the importance of action. We care about ensuring our country leads by example. And when we need the, win the next election, we will do what ministers aren't, and that is to deliver. I have three specific questions for the minister. When does the minister expect a ban to be brought to this house? What specific discussions has the minister had with colleagues in the Welsh government and the Scottish government about their work to impose a ban? And finally, will ministers work with all those of us who want to make sure the Kept Animals Bill comes back? And would they support an, end, an amendment to the Kept Animals Bill that bans the use of snares in England? I'm happy to be written to with answers, but I would like a response, please. Um, and I want to say, um, in response to the latest um, question on snares, in, um, as already been mentioned, in May 2022, the Secretary of State stated the call for evidence on the use of snares would be published in due course. We are now eight months on from that and at least two and a half years from the, the original question. So can the minister tell us when the government will put out that call finally? And I want to finish, Chair, by thanking the Honourable Member for introducing this debate. Thank you. Minister Trudy Harrison. <coughs> Thank you very much indeed, Mr Vickers. And it really is a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship, I believe, for the first time. Um, during this very important debate, and I must start by thanking um, my honourable friend, the member for Don Valley, on securing this debate, but also to all of those many um, here listening to the debate who have helped to secure over 102,000 signatures on the petition. Um, and also, can I thank my honourable friend, the member for Don Valley, for requesting that this debate is a civil and a polite, full, respectful debate, listening to the various views. And it is of particular um, relevance, I think, that we have heard from two farmers in this debate with a first-hand lived experience. I, too, have always lived in the countryside as a farmer's granddaughter. I'm also aware of the devastation that be can be caused um, by foxes in particular and, and the need for control of predatory species. I would also say that it is, of course, and I'm sure the member for Strangford would agree, not just predation, which is the cause of nature's decline. It is in many, many aspects, and, uh, and that is why we'll be bringing forward our environmental improvement plan um, at the end of this month, which will far more fully explain what in DEFRA, with many other organisations, and society, because this is really a priority for the whole of society, to ensure that nature recovers. But having a plan for predators is certainly part of that. Um, the petition triggered today's debate, and of course it's raised many concerns uh, that people who set free-running snares, the type which relax when the animal stops pulling, are indiscriminate. They cannot ensure animal welfare, they cause unnecessary suffering to mammals and should be banned. And I do also want to set out what the law is, the current law, already in action on the use of snares. Snares that have been set in position and that are such a nature and so um, placed as can be calculated to cause injury to any wild animal must be inspected at least once a day. And all of the accounts that I have heard today, I am pretty sure that those snares were not inspected, therefore breaking the law. It is illegal to use a self-locking snare. The Animal Welfare Act 2006 prohibits causing unnecessary suffering to an animal under the control of man. Man or woman, I'm sure, would be the inclusive term. Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981 states it's illegal to set in position any trap or snare calculated to cause bodily injury to any wild animal included in Schedule 6, such as badgers, such as otters, red squirrels and hedgehogs. 
The Deer Act 1991 makes it an offence to set in position any trap or snare calculated to cause bodily injury to any deer coming into contact with or to use any trap or snare for the purpose of killing or taking any deer. And it's illegal to set in position any trap or snare calculated to cause bodily injury to any wild animal included in Schedule 6 um, of the Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981 or to use a snare for the purpose of killing, taking or restraining such an animal. So there are already are a number of laws in place aiming to try to protect wildlife. But what has been clear from today's debate, one moment, what has been clear from today's debate is that um, whilst the law is there, snares are used indiscriminately and they are not checked. And there is a code of practice that should be followed that is clearly not being followed. And in preparation for this debate, I looked into this myself. What are the guidelines on our own website in DEFRA for the appropriate use of snares? And I will be the first to admit that the information is not clear and must be improved. And that will be done um, uh, in very short order. Um, I will give way, though. Thank you, talked about how the law currently as it stands would prevent the kind of suffering that we've heard around this chamber today. Clearly the law has not been observed, so I wondered if she has in her preparation for today managed to find out any information about any prosecutions mm -hmm. that have been brought as a result of the kind of suffering we're hearing about. Minister. Um, the Honourable Member makes an excellent point, and as she can, uh, uh, I'm sure, imagine, I tried to find out this very information but because wildlife crime is not a notifiable crime, it's nigh on impossible to find out that information. So I have instead resorted to contact the RSPCA today to request an urgent meeting with them because I know that members of the public who find animals in distress often turn to the RSPCA first for assistance and that is why I'm having that meeting. And I hope you would also be pleased to hear, um, along with the shadow spokesperson, person for um, the opposition that I'm reaching out to devolved administrations in Scotland and also in Wales to see what lessons have been learned from the measures in place already in Scotland and also to understand the rationale for the proposals in Wales as well. So I'm very much keen to understand um, how uh, my counterparts in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland um, are protecting wildlife. I will give way. Could she set a time frame around her piece of work and when she's going to bring that to a conclusion and therefore move forward with legislation to bring in hopefully what we want to see on this side at least is a ban? There have been uh, multiple calls for me to uh, give further confirmation on the call for evidence that was identified in the Animal Welfare Action Plan. Whilst I'm not able to provide any further information on that in this uh, debate what I can say is the environmental improvement plan is being worked on pretty much night and day I was certainly working on this over the Christmas period and we I have every uh, um, confidence that that will be published on time at the end of January um, and in terms of the progress that has already been made on the animal welfare action plan um, I'd be very happy to, to write to the Honourable Member with a detailed explanation. I have one in front of me, but as it's 15 pages long, I don't have time uh, to go through that in detail now. Uh, one final time. Ruth Jones. Thank you, Minister. And I'll be very quick. Um, and so the, the Minister just said that she, um, she would um, make the call for evidence by the end of this month. It, I'm just checking for, for correctness here. Is that, is that correct? Am that I is not correct, no. What I'm ex uh, referring to is the Environmental Improvement Plan, which was a, a condition of the Environment Act 2018 to provide such a document by the end of January, and I am confident and very much looking forward to that being the case. Um, so there is no... I, I'm afraid I won't give way any further. Um, I'm a, th there's no question that if used incorrectly, snares can cause significant injuries and suffering to the animals for which they were set. And though accidental capture to non-target species for which snaring is entirely appropriate. Um, 
In 2021, the government published, as I've said, the Action Plan for Animal Welfare with a commendable aim of ensuring high animal welfare standards. The programme of work has already delivered some outstanding outcomes, such as banning the use of glue traps and including um, introducing legislation to crack down on the abhorrent practice of illegal hair coursing. Additionally, current legislation already provides strong protection for the, wild, the welfare of trapped animals, and anyone using snares must act within the law to ensure that their activities do not harm protected species, as I've already set out. Penalties include an unlimited fine or a custodial sentence. We urge those with concerns relating to the misuse of snares to pass these concerns to the police for investigation. We have to prioritise government time. Um, and it's, it's been many years since this issue has been debated so thoroughly. And I, I really do thank my honourable friends once again um, for discussing this in so much detail. Um, I'm aware that Wales, as has already been said, taken the recent decision to prohibit the use of snares and note that Scotland are also reviewing their approach. So as um, I have reiterated, I will work with devolved administrations to understand the implications, but I am also concerned that we must protect the lapwing, the curlew, the ground nesting birds, and this will be a balanced approach. We will observe how friends in devolved administrations implement their proposed changes to snaring, and I hope that we can learn from different approaches. I will certainly keep an open mind whether any new rules and regulations are required in England in the future. I thank um, Mr Vickers for excellent chairmanship of this meeting. I'll leave the last word to my honourable friend, the member for Don Valley, who has done a sterling job in bringing forward this debate for us to discuss today. Nick Fletcher to wind up. Thank you. I would like to thank all members um, today for um, speaking in this, in this important debate. I'd like to thank the petitioners uh, and uh, the, 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 the members of the public who have joined us today with regarding uh, re regarding this debate. I'd like to thank the, key, the committee uh, the team for uh, the petitions committee, should I say, who work ever so hard uh, throughout the year to bring all these different debates to, um, to us uh, here in this, in this, in this hall. Um, I just want to mention the members that have spoken. Um, the member for, um, uh, member for York Central spoke of um, the snares catching um, Animals. Seventy-five percent of them were not the, the target uh, target animal, and she spoke of technology too. Maybe we can do some work with that. The MP for Chatham and Hellsford just said uh, we required action now. We just needed to get on with it. Uh, the member for Rutherglen and Hamilton spoke of the decision recently of the BVA who called for an outright ban. And the MP for Sheffield, Hallam, spoke of um, the breakaway device not actually operating um, as it should with um, smaller animals that weren't the actual target animal. Um, I just want to go to the members for um, Scarborough and Whitby and for um, Strangford. I do believe that we need to uh, listen to the, the voice of um, experience sometimes as well and as, uh, as the minister mentioned uh, herself who also comes from a background of, uh, of farming I do generally think we need to um, listen to what uh, these, um, these, th these uh, members say because I think it's extremely important um, it's three to one in here from what I can gather I've just said of people actually wanting to ban that and that is a similar um, number out in the of the population, but how many of those people that want to ban it have actually had a life uh, dealing with uh, foxes and dealing with the implications of um, of uh, this this type of um, uh, injury to um, curlews and to lapwings and obviously to chickens and to different things. So I do think we should uh, have a civil debate. We've had one today. I think that's been fantastic to have that. I think we should have further debates, and I'm glad the government are working on this, but uh, it's important that uh, we take a, a balanced view, and I'll finish just with what the, um, um, 
the member from Strangford said it should be proportionate and justified. And I think that's, uh, that's a good place to end. So I thank everybody today. Thank you. The question is that this House has considered e-petition 600593 relating to the use of snares. As many are of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Order, order. The House stands adjourned.